faith in the name of Jesus. Yeah, really Power in the name God. of Jesus.
begin to worship the Lord, he just comes, well, I started to say comes down, but he rises up. He rises up from within us. Makes, his, makes himself, a, a, makes us aware of his presence in our lives. And we're so grateful to be in the house of God this morning. Grateful that you're here with us. And I'm just going to ask you this morning as we continue in our worship and get into the word and so on, that you just be open and have your heart open. Be willing to receive from the Lord this morning. And uh, allow him just to minister to you. We live in a crazy old world, don't we? Praise God, it's good so often to come in and just shut the doors behind you and just get along with people, like-minded people for a little while and worship the Lord. So uh, let's just continue to praise him this morning. I'm going to go ahead and pray over our offering and ask the blessings of God on that. And then let's just continue to worship, okay? Would you pray with us, please? Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness in our life. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, that is so refreshing to us. Lord, it raises us, it encourages us, it strengthens us. Oh, Father, it gives us strength for the journey. And I pray you go with us today. Let us enter into your presence, Lord, that we might be stronger and more like you. Bless the offering this morning as we give. Multiply it, Lord, and let us go forth and do the things that you've set before us. I ask, ask you, Lord, continue to bless the singing today, Lord, the worship. Bless the word of God. Touch every person that's here, Lord, today. Let your anointing move upon them, Lord, that lives might be changed in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
feet up before you even ask. But thank God, when he comes down, Brother Kevin, and he puts his big old hand on the top of my head. most 
uh, theologians and commentaries and so on who <laughs> believe that this is a, an intentional trip to continue to go further and further north to leave the more populated cities and the crowds and the hecticness because now he has began to turn his ministry from the direct of the crowds and the people and so on to begin now to try to prepare his disciples for what lays ahead of them. And so in order to do so, he needed to take them to a place where they would not have interruption. They would not have all of the hecticness and the, and the controversy even of all the things that they dealt with on a daily basis. And so they come here to this place, uh, Caesarea Philippi. Then Jesus begins his discourse with them, what he wants to say to them. He's ready to reveal himself and begin to try to talk to them about what they are about to face. But I found it interesting, he begins his discourse with a question. And that question is, by the way, guys, who, who do they say that I am? And of course, they gave the answers. Some say you're Elias, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. Some, somebody thinks that you're, you're the one that's come back and so on. And he said, then, but to the 12, but, but who do you say? The crowds can say anything. I, I'm, not, I'm not as much concerned about the crowds as I am with you. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, being the kind of a louder, more vocal one in the group we know, Peter immediately spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was a great confession by Peter. It was, a, it was a confession that Jesus recognized that did not come from flesh and blood. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, or Simon, son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood, you know, words, you don't know this because, <coughs> excuse me, you don't know this because somebody told it to you. You know this because something inside of you, you've got received a, a spiritual, a revelation that, that I am the Christ. And he said, he went on to say, thou art Peter, a stone, a rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now he wasn't talking about building upon Peter. He's talking about building upon the rock of that statement. That statement is the rock. That statement is the thing the church is built upon, is the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. But what I found as interesting, and I hadn't really picked up on this before in all the times I've read this, is that not only was there this statement by the Apostle Peter, which, a, which was a profound statement, but there was also the confirmation that came behind that. The confirmation of Jesus himself to say, you're right. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being there in that time when you, you know, you, you've always believed it according to the scriptures and according to what you've seen and his teachings and, and everything else. I mean, we're all talking among ourselves and saying, man, this is got to be him. God, this, this is got to be him. And so we're following him and we're showing our faith. But now you come down to the point and Peter speaks up and says what the whole rest of the group is thinking. So don't think it was only Peter who had this revelation. The rest of them were still there. And so that tells me they all believe, they all agree, they believe the same thing. And so you not only have this statement, you have the confirmation from Jesus. You're right. You talk about being a static. I mean, just literally on cloud nine. He has finally admitted it. We don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to assume. He is the Christ. And not only is he the Christ, we're with him. We're in on this thing. And so he not only confirms, but then he goes on to give them a promise. He said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against him. Now, when Jesus says something like that, what kind of boldness are you going to get? Amen. I mean, all of a sudden, they know, well, he is, he is the Messiah, and he is with them, and he has chosen them, and he's going to be with them. And he 
says, the gates of, upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm going to give to you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, all 12 of you, the keys of the kingdom. Yeah. And you're going to be able to pray and speak and bind and loose. I mean, look, it just keeps getting better and better, don't it? I mean, we found out here, and we're in, this, we're in this little intimate setting, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah that was promised, but that we're only in on this thing with him, and now he is making promises to us, our time spent, our dedication, our leaving our nets and our fathers and everything. Man, we were right all along. But notice then, he started in uh, verse number 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders. And so now you have all of this building and building and building, this climatic uh, revelation of who he is. And now you've got a twist. His, his focus, of course, is in, prep, in preparing his disciples. Now the veil has been lifted. Now we're not wandering anymore. His plan is revealed. And he begins now to say, now I want to tell you what's going to happen. I'm, now from here we're going to go and we're going to make our way back down into Jerusalem. And when we get down into Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested and killed and raised on the third day. I don't think they even heard him say raise on the third day. All they heard is I'm going to be killed. Yeah. I mean, they might have heard it, but it evidently didn't do anything for them at that time. And I began to look at this scripture. And I thought, in the mind of these <coughs> disciples, they go from this ecstatic, joyous time to an absolute place of confusion in their mind. Go with me on this thought process. We've just learned you're the Messiah. You've just learned, listen, you said the gates of hell can't prevail against him. And now you're telling me there's some Jewish leaders and some Roman soldiers that's going to kill you? How's that? I mean, on one hand you're saying, I'm the Messiah. On the other hand, saying I'm going to get killed. How is it possible? That you can be the Messiah. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the promises that you make to us are all true. And yet you turn around and say this. So Peter <coughs> calls him Messiah. It said he took him. Did you notice that? And, and some of the translations even use the word aside. In the King James it simply says he took him. But some of the later translations say he took him aside. Maybe slipped his arm around him and kind of walked him over in the side, away from the rest of them. I mean, because now he's Peter the Rock. And so now he calls the Lord aside. Hey, listen, buddy. Uh, just want to just want to say here. Don't, don't, don't be saying things like that. I mean, you get the picture. Surely this is not one. Far be it from you for this to happen. <coughs> and I can see Jesus shrug that hand off of his shoulder and turn around and look at him and rebuke and say, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. What do you mean I'm an offense? You just told me I'm the rock. Peter went from being a rock to being a stumbling stone in a matter of just a few minutes. Why is he in all of a sudden now an offense? Why is he all of a sudden an offense when he was, he was a hero just a few verses ago? <coughs> the reason is because he said, Thou savorest not the things that be of God. When I think about the word savor, we use the word savor in our culture, and savor is, to me, savor is kind of like a taste thing. You know, you put something in your mouth and just, Savor, you enjoy the taste of it. But that's not what this word means. The savor, it, it's interpreted. In fact, I was reading uh, several other places where this word savor is at. 
And I read where 26 more times in the New Testament this word <coughs> or, or a tense of this word is used. And the word means to set your mind. To think, to, to direct your mind. That's, that's the that's original meaning. To direct. You don't direct your mind on the things of God. You're not thinking about the things of God. It's, just, and it's used in the book of Romans by the Apostle Paul and in the book of Ephesians and so on. By the Apostle Paul when he said that the carnal mind is enmity against God. He, he uses it when he says to set your mind on the things of God in the book of Colossians. He, he, he uses it over and over in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 when he's talking about the Gentiles. He said, I say now, walk not like other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind and what they're setting their mind upon. And so Jesus said, you're, now you're an offense to me. You're one of my 12 intimate ones. But now you're an offense because now you are not setting your mind on the things that be of God. You're not thinking towards the things that be of God. What was Peter doing? Well, it's pretty obvious. Peter was stating what he wanted. Peter was thinking like you and I probably would do. He spoke based on what he wanted. He had this little bit of knowledge. He had this little bit of knowledge, which, which is a great piece of knowledge. But now he really is the son of God. But now because he thinks he, he knows he really is the Son of God, now he knows what he's going to do. Now he's going to come. Now we're going back down to Jerusalem, and he's finally going to do it. He's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to take the seat of authority, and the, and the Jews are going to be gathered back together again, and all of the promises of the Old Testament are going to start to roll together. And Jesus, in no certain terms, basically said, no, that's not the plan. We're going back to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be killed. And when I started to think about these, this turn of events here, I started to think about my life, your life, our life in this culture. I wonder how many times the Lord might say that same thing to you and me. Thou savorest not the things that be of God. You're not thinking about the things that are of God. Even sometimes in our prayer life, we get down on our knees and we begin to pray and sometimes even begin to beg God. Oh, God, please do this. And I've heard people even pray things that, that are not, not scriptural, not, not even <coughs> right, let alone scriptural. We have got to as believers, as Christians, we have got to be aware of that, church. We live in a world where people are watching us. And when we act like everybody else, then we're not setting our mind on the things that are of God. When we think that we've got this thing all figured out, and that we, have, we, we can represent the Lord and, and speaking for him and, oh, well, I know why that happened and I know why this happened. And we take the scripture and, and we, we make everything. To be perfectly honest with you, I hear preachers and so on sometimes talk about the scriptures and explain things like they just know all the things that everybody else don't know. There's a lot of things that the Bible literally does not tell us. We assume certain things. And we figure if this happened, then, then this, this, and this must have been part of it. And, and so we present it that way. And sometimes we don't do the scriptures any harm by doing so, but I think sometimes you can. And so when we begin to look at our own life, and we begin to pray, and we begin to seek God, and we begin to think about those things, the Bible teaches us to seek God the will of God, the glory of God. How will God be glorified? How will God be glorified in my life? Lord, I'm going through a trial right now. Uh, how can I glorify you through this trial? Not just get me out, get me out, get me out, get me out. How can I live through this trial that will glorify your name? And I know that's not our thought process all the time. I hear it, and you hear it. Oh, why would God allow this to 
happen to me? Where is God when my world is falling apart? Sometimes, how do I say this? There are some lessons that can't be learned through victories and deliverance. There are some lessons that can only be learned by walking through that valley, by carrying that load, by going through those things. And as it's been said, sometimes the very things that we pray for God to remove, God has chosen to place. Paul said, I prayed three times, Lord, that you'd remove this thorn from my life. And the Lord could have very well said, it's not in the scriptures, but the Lord didn't remove it. So the Lord could have very well said, I ain't moving it, I'll put it there. What does the thorn do for you? It keeps you coming back to the Lord, no. <coughs> Can you imagine if you never did need the Lord for anything? Have you ever seen a child? Let me just, let me just be practical for a second. Have you ever seen a little child that got every single thing he or she ever wanted? child is that? <laughs> Not a very good one, huh? That's the one you see plop down in the grocery aisle and pitch a fit and mom says, well, okay, go ahead. There are some lessons in life that we have got to keep in mind. God's will. And I'm not standing here today to tell you if you're going through a trial, and, oh, it's God's will for you to go through that trial. I have no idea. But I do know this. God can use that trial. Sure can. Yes, Whether it was his plan or not, God can use it. Amen. Sometimes, just be honest, sometimes the trials and the problems that come to our life are our own fault. Yes. Yes. Amen. We have made bad decisions. We've made bad connections. We've made rash decisions. Yes. So on. And so guess what? Eventually, what goes around comes around. And we have to walk through those times. The, the scriptures here just, this, this just really shook me when I went back this week and was just reading through the book of Matthew. And I come across these verses of scripture again. And I know that part where it says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and so on. And most times when people have to preach out of this text, that's what they're going for. But I noticed so quickly the same Peter, the same Peter that spoke and was correcting his speaking, all of a sudden got lifted up and thought he was going to correct the Lord. I mean, now he's already got on the Lord's good side. He's bragging on him. So now he's going to correct him. Because he has a little bit of knowledge, now he's got it figured out. Can I tell you, ain't none of us got it figured out. Amen. Amen. Ain't none of us got a monopoly on this thing. Amen. We don't, we don't fully comprehend all the things about God and for God and up scriptures and so on and so forth. I don't care if you've been a student of the word all your life. There's still things that we don't know. Amen. Amen. The truth of the matter is there's things the scriptures do not tell us. There are things, there are pieces of information that God did not give us and does not give us. And so when we look at this world and we begin to live in it and we begin to see these things, sometimes people that start to create a God that is more like what they want. They, they want a God that doesn't leave them high and dry in their mind. Things didn't go the way they wanted them to go, so that means God left me high and dry. I prayed and nothing happened. I prayed and nothing happened. So, I had nothing to that. Listen, church, let me, let me just get to my point here. What God has got for us is better than what we got for us. Amen. God's plan for us is better than our plan for us. And if you begin to look at these, this scripture, we can see it right here as a prime example. The plan that God had for Jesus to go to the cross, to die for the sins of the world, was a much better plan than for these disciples to be lifted up and be able to rule over Jerusalem.
kingdom with the Lord. For him to go and, and overthrow the authorities and do all the things they thought he was going to do, that, that plan was, would not have been good for me and you. Because in that plan, we're still lost. You begin to look back in the scriptures and you see different stories and different things, different people. I thought about David, who loved the Lord with all of his heart. And he wanted to build the house of God. I was reading in the book of Samuel about that again this week. And he, and he wanted to build the house of God. And God said, no, you're not going to build this temple. The first temple. Because all they had had up until then was this curtain, this ark that they carried through the wilderness. And the, and the ark lived in a tent. That was the house of God. And David said, I'm going to build a brand big house for God. And God said, no, I don't want you to build a house. Your hand, you, you, you're, you're a man of war. Your hands have shed a lot of blood. I got a better plan. I'm going to let your son build that house. And then I'm going to make a covenant with you. And I'm going to promise you that there will not fail to be one of your seed to sit upon the throne in Israel. Amen. And that's what we know as that Davidic covenant, which Christ came and fulfilled, born of the seed and the lineage of David, to sit upon the throne of David. And, and even in the coming kingdom to rule. God's plan was better than David's plan. Amen. Wasn't it? Amen. God's plan was better than David's plan. You look at Abraham, who had a, a desire to, to have children. God said, I'm going to bless you like the stars of the heaven, the sand of the... That's how many kids you're going to have. And here he is getting up in age, or almost past having children, and he still don't have any. And so he says, well, I think maybe I better just kind of help God out a little bit. And so he goes in with his wife's consent. He goes into their handmaid, whose name is Hagar. And Hagar, sure enough, has a child. And his name is Ishmael. And God said in the book of Genesis, after this child was born and began to grow up as a little child, God said to Abraham as he was praying, God said, Abraham, this will not be your heir. In other words, this is not the heir that I promised you. You didn't do this my way. This ain't the one I chose. And so God continued to wait. Until Abraham was 99 years old. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? 99 years old. Sarah right behind me. And they conceive a child. My wife and I just adopted a little girl. We're excited about. Back in November. And I'm 59. And me and her had conversation for months. Saying, we can't do this. We're too old to do this. We can't, brother. We, we just can't do this. But in the end, guess what we did? We did. Amen. I can't imagine starting at 99. A brand new child at 99. But this was the seed of promise. I can name uh, Isaac's children. The Bible tells us about them. The Bible also tells us about Ishmael's children. Can you name any of Ishmael's children? <laughs> Probably not. Can you name any of Isaac's children? Oh, yeah. Jacob and Esau, the 12 tribes that came out, all of these children, grandchildren, the lineage by which Christ came into the world. God's plan was better than their plan. Amen. Hallelujah. God's plan is always better than our plan. Wherever we are in our world and in our life right now, it doesn't mean that everything has is, is just got to be accepted and any problem and any trouble, and you just say, ah, well, you know, there's no need now. 
No, we, do, we live the best we can. We make the best choices we can. We do our very best to be uh, in the center of God's will with everything that we can. But we live with this consciousness in our mind that God is still the one that's in charge. He's in charge of our life. He's in charge of our direction. He can take us where he wants us to go. He can bring into our life what he wants. He can, do, he can keep us. He can deliver us. He can encourage us. He can walk us through valleys we thought we'd never make it through. He can take us to heights we thought we'd never reach. He can do anything he wants to do. And we have got to stop limiting this mindset that says that we're in control of our lives and we're in control of our future. And if we don't get this right, I don't know what we're going to do. And I don't know how I'm going to make it. Now listen, we are children of the Most High God. He loves us and cares for us. And He has a plan for us. And our goal, our goal is to seek God. The goal is not the new house. The goal is to seek God. It might include a new house. I don't know. But it might not. The more that we read these scriptures and the more we begin to think about how that God's plan is better than our plan, the more we should be humbled. Amen. And not arrogant. Humbled. I notice. The scriptures that came after what I read, I didn't read it to you today, but if you read past where I stopped reading after he said, Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man, that statement was made directly to Peter. But then look at what he's turned then and said to the rest of the disciples. It's a scripture we quote all the time, but this is the context. This is when it was said. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So that doesn't just mean gritting your teeth every day and saying, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. That means considering that your plan is not as good as God's plan. And your will is not like his. See, some people measure out their will as if their will and their choice and their direction is equal with God's. you got two equal ones. Which one will you choose? No, you do not have two equal ones. Amen. You have one that is far and away greater than the other one. The Bible says, as the heavens are far above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. My plans higher than your plans. What in the world could God do in our life? How could he use us? If we stop thinking about, well, Lord, I, I need you to do this for me, and I need you to do that for me, and I need you to fix this one, and I need you to fix that. If we just start saying, God, how can you use me today? God, how can you be glorified through my voice, through my hands, through my actions, through my hugs, through my, through my gifts, through the things that I can do and the things that I can give? Thou savorest not the things that be of God. You're not setting your mind on the things that be of God. That's what he said to Peter. Well, you look at a, a carnal-minded church world today and tell me that God would not say the same or stricter. When coming to church is about getting motivational speeches. And when we come and we and we and the Lord and somebody tells you how much you're blessed and how much God wants to bless you and how everything in your life is just going to work out and, and all we got to do we just need to be positive and all of those things. Listen, we, this this Christian life is not just good moral living. Yeah. This is all about surrender and submission. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We're not just following some grand scheme. We're following a man called Jesus Christ. Amen. We are surrendering our lives to him. We are living according to what his word said. We are following him. We are in connection with him. We are praying with him. We are living in a way that he lived. That's why we're called Christians. Christ-like. My goodness, when they were called Christians in the book of Acts, that was not a compliment. That was a very derogatory term when they called all them old, them old Christians. Them people think they're living like Jesus, these Christ-like ones. 
Nowadays, we put it on a on a lapel and wear it on a pin and wear it on our lapel. Because as long as we can carry the name tag, that's all we need. Yeah. Not according to God. Not according to the Lord. Said in Colossians, set your mind upon the things of God. A mind that is set upon the things of God is a mind that is not connected to everything else in the world at the same time. You cannot do both. Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians and he talked about the renewing of your mind. The renewing, even he said, the renewing of your inner mind. Romans 12, he said the renewing of the mind. The book of Ephesians, he said the renewing, to renew the inner man on a daily basis, to get that new man new. What in the world is the difference in the world and the church of a Christian if we don't think differently? If we don't, cause if we don't think differently, then we're not going to live differently. You can't think like the old man and live like the new man. It's, it's impossible. Right. Thou savest not the things that be of God. So on a daily basis, what's that look like? That looks like being consistently conscious of God's will and God's glory. <laughs> things we do and the things we say and the way we conduct ourselves and the way we handle other people and everything else would glorify God. It means being sensitive as a servant of God to look around the world and see people that are hurting or in trouble or whatever. And that we slow down long enough to be able to see them. And that we'd be able to reach out to them and make a difference and an impact in their life. It means giving diligence to the scriptures on a daily basis. You can't please God if you don't know how to please God. If you don't know anything about what the scripture says and how to live in the scriptures and how to how to treat folks and how to follow the Lord and what the word of God says and those things, then what we find ourselves doing is living what we do know. And what we do know is the culture. What we do know is what Hollywood said. What we do know is what Washington said. What we need to know is what Jesus said. Amen. Dedicating ourselves to prayer, time alone with God. But when we get up in the morning, Rhonda, will you come back, please? When we get up in the morning, we think this thought. Today, I want to set my mind on the things of Today, I want to set my mind on the things of God, on the work of God, on pleasing God, on living a life before Him. As I've said before, we set our mind on living corn bell, which was the old Latin phrase the early church reformers used, corn bell, living before God. Living daily before God. Living under the watchful eye of the Master. Him seeing everything we do. Him knowing our thoughts. Mind, a mind set upon the things of God. I think it was Dwight Moody who made the statement in one of his messages. Dwight Moody said, I want you to know the world has never seen what God can do with a man who is 100% committed to him outside of Jesus. I thought, man, that's a big statement. Because so much of our commitments and so much of our thinking, so much of our perspectives and our worldview is based on the world all around us. We are different. If you're a believer, you're different. You think differently. You don't look at everything the same way. You don't accept everything that everybody else accepts. So I'm speaking to you this morning about setting our mind upon the things of God. Savoring, as the word says here. Savoring, setting our mind, directing our mind. And the best way to direct your mind is to get the word of God in there. Word of God in there and begin to go over the Word and learn the Word and memorize the Word. Then you begin to find your 
yourself thinking more and more like you're supposed to. I'm going to ask you this morning if you will come and pray with us. I just, maybe you're just going to seek the Lord about setting your mind upon Him, upon the things of God. Seek the Lord about, Lord, let me seek you. Let me, let me seek you while I'm at work, while I'm at home, when I'm with my family. Let me be conscious of the things of God. Let me never forget that I'm your child, that I am with you. I am for you. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to help us today to set our mind upon the things of God. Wherever we are, whoever we're with, Lord, that we are yours. That we are the man of God, the woman of God. No matter where we are or what's going on. That our actions, our words, our behaviors, our attitudes, our speech would be given to you. For there's no holiday. Thank you. 